drink and then some on the grass, some long for the huntsman's loud call. But where can be found such a musical sound as the old right big cry on the wall? On the ball, on the ball, on the ball, through scrum its street corners and all. Sticking together we keep on the leather and shout as we go on the ball. On the cold wintry day when the ball is away, let sluggards at home then remain. We'll kick and we'll follow, we'll run fast and call as we shout the same merry Rugby is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as a form of football where the ball may be carried. But in New Zealand it has a much deeper meaning. It's the national winter game and does have an impact on the national character. Wherever there's a group of New Zealanders, someone will set up goalposts to have some sort of game. Maoris have contributed a lot to the style of play. Many of the greatest stars in representative teams have been Māori players. The majority of New Zealanders grow up with rugby, and every Saturday during the winter, literally thousands of teams take to the fields to play what appears to the uninitiated a strange game. Rugby is played with an oval ball by 15 men aside, consisting of eight forwards who try to gain possession of the ball in rucks, scrums and lineouts and seven fast-running backs who try to carry it over the opposition's goal line. A man can be tackled only when carrying the ball. Points are scored by touching the ball down behind the goal line and place or drop kicking it over the goalposts. started in 1823, when a pupil of Rugby College England, William Webb Ellis, ran with the ball during a traditional game of soccer and started the now famous game of rugby. In New Zealand, the early settlers, after years of trying many games, adopted the sport of rugby. It apparently appealed to the temperament of these rugged pioneers, for it quickly grew in popularity as a relaxation after a hard week's work. Well, maybe relaxation is the wrong term, if this cartoon drawn at the turn of the century is any indication. It was a rough and ready game, which was played anywhere there was a bit of flat ground. Teams had up to 30 men aside, and it was the survival of the fittest. But with the taming of New Zealand came the taming of rugby. It's now played to a strict code, and today doting mothers allow their small sons to play the game. The youngest grade is the Bantams. Maximum weight, 63 pounds. That's four and a half stone. Average age, eight to nine years, and budding All Blacks, every one of them. To play for New Zealand and wear the famous All Black jersey is the schoolboy dream. Many retired All Blacks spend a lot of their spare time training the lower grades. We asked Bob Scott, who played fullback for New Zealand for many years, about young boys playing the game. I think they get a lot out of it. Uh, development of the skills of the game, the, uh, the, the teamwork, uh, all those sort of things are developed. Uh, the only point I would make, as long as they, they don't, uh, uh, they are not urged on too much to the degree where they can uh, get knocked about and possibly lose a lot of their confidence, which takes a lot of, uh, well, regaining in, in later years. And I think that is a point that, uh, that should be uh, watched very, very closely in young boys playing the game. As these players have a set schedule of games, we asked him if he thought it could become too organised. Well, I feel that uh, young boys playing sport at an early age can become too organised, although I am in agreement with them playing as, as early as they possibly can, uh, mainly on the idea of that they learn the, the basic skills. Uh, rugby is a, a body contact game. The only thing that I feel that happens is that uh, uh, coaches and uh, uh, a tremendous number of parents are inclined to, to urge the boys on to a, to a more or less a, a gladiatorial type of thing rather than the, the game.
a father can always see all black potential in his son. But whether he reaches the top or not, a boy receives a good grounding in the sport. And as he progresses up through the grades, his prowess improves. By the time he reaches high school, the rules of rugby are second nature, and competition starts in earnest. It's the ambition of every rugby playing boy to play for the school first 15 in an inter-school fixture. Many of these tournaments have years of tradition behind them and are hotly contested by the pupils and avidly followed by the old boys. This annual conflict between Nelson, Wellington, Whanganui and Christ's colleges is one of the oldest in the country and has been going on for over 60 years. We asked Mr Locke, a retired principal, about rugby in high schools. I feel that rugby offers an outlet for a boy's natural aggressiveness. Uh, all boys are to some extent aggressive and uh, rugby allows them to work it off in a sort of catharsis. Uh, again, uh, rugby does enhance the prestige of the school and uh, indirectly uh, helps the morale and the tone of the school. The boys are proud to go to that particular school if the, if the school is doing well at uh, rugby. And uh, they do get the sense of all working towards one end, uh, the team spirit. I think that rugby reaches its uh, highest and most enjoyable level anyhow at the secondary school stage. But uh, they also have at that age uh, ideas of sportsmanship which don't always carry over into the uh, more adult sporting world. While at school, a boy has time for football, but when he leaves, he has to be keen and dedicated to continue with the sport. Training must be done after work and takes up a lot of a player's spare time during the winter months. Club rugby is a great social leveler. It's a man's ability on the field that counts. Men from all walks of life come together as equals, all working together, trying to improve their rugby and the club's success. The first requirement of a rugby player is that he's fit. Training normally starts with a warm-up and the boys throw the ball around a bit. For this, the team works together as all players must be able to handle the ball. We then split the forwards and backs up for specialised training. The scrum machine is very handy as it allows the backs to get on with their work instead of just acting as an opposition scrum. Most clubs in the cities have floodlit practice grounds where training can continue on winter nights. An important part of the training is to work out situations the boys will come up against in their game. This teamwork is a basis of rugby. Fifteen blokes working for the one end. The city players are very fortunate in having experienced coaches, gymnasiums, floodlit grounds and usually eight to five o'clock type jobs. These boys are lucky, but rugby is also very popular in the country areas allowed one player to run and run and run all day. Now that's up to the forwards and up to the backs. For farmers, it's not so easy. They have no groundsman kept fields and their farms may be many miles from the football club in the nearest township. With many All Blacks coming from the farming community, we asked Don Clark about the isolation problems. With his brothers, he did most of his early training on their farm in the Waikato. The problems of a country player um, are perhaps wet grounds and uh, time to train uh, after all your commitments, uh, your feeding out, your uh, extra duties, milking cows. Uh, there's a lot to be done on a farm and uh, to, to endeavour to try and uh, make time in training after a very wet season, uh, to finish milking early uh, and to get out before the, uh, uh, it gets really dark it's, it's very awkward, but I found that the only way to overcome it was to uh, 
um, train her respective. Perhaps do a little bit of training on the road if it was too wet. Uh, but nine times out of ten, we uh, kept on the on the field, or on the grass, and uh, ran round and round the paddocks, kicking the balls was another uh, point we had to try and make up. And uh, this is very, very important for us. And uh, it was worthwhile because of all the hard work and extra work that you put in it. Even with all these problems, Don Clark became probably New Zealand's greatest fullback. Nicknamed the boot, his kicking scored a phenomenal 207 points for New Zealand in 10 years of international play. His vertical placing of the ball and stab kicking was famous and helped New Zealand win many tests. For international honours, many try but obviously not all are chosen. Oh, I think I play rugby because I enjoy it. And I think it tends to create good team spirit and sportsmanship among your fellow players. I play rugby because I think it's the most invigorating game of all that I've actually played. Oh, because I enjoy it, because of the physical exercise I get out of it and keeps my body in decent health. Oh, well, I think it's the enjoyment you get out of it, really. And uh, I feel it keeps me out of mischief too, if I'm training two nights a week and game on Saturday. It keeps me healthy. Well mainly because it's a, a manly game uh, it uh, requires a, a lot of uh, physical contact with the opposition uh, and it requires a lot of teamwork and the effort to uh, sort of outwit your opponents um, gives a, one a tremendous amount of thrill. Uh, it's a hard sport and I think it's a real man sport and uh, the hard knocks and that you get that adds to the enjoyment of the game. Uh, uh, besides that, uh, uh, you go out in a paddock, especially a forward, you get a bit worked up and get rid of a bit of steam off your chest. And afterwards you're at the same bloke, but you had a big argument which you can go down there, down to the gym, have a few beers at him and, and, uh, and shake hands. And after the game, you're all such jolly good friends afterwards, you, you don't really realise you've been belting somebody else around. And because of this, it uh, gives you a, a better outlook on life. You don't go down the street possibly uh, looking for a fight in particular. You've already had it, uh, in a sense, on, on the rugby field. Every year, spectators see players carried off the field, some never to play the sport again. We ask Don Clark, who retired because of an injury, about this problem. It has been said that rugby is a, a, a pretty rough game. Well, in actual fact, it's, it's not. Uh, the fitter you are, the, the better the knock, or the harder the knock you can take. And also, um, I feel, as I said before, it's very, very important that you have a few uh, of these edges knocked off you. Um, any bodily contact game is reasonably hard. But um, th this is the important thing. Uh, uh, disputing possession in the line-out, uh, hard, rugged tackling, hard rucking is all important uh, fact of the game. But the number of players that play it and the number of players that get hurt would be, uh, well, uh, out of all um, thoughts of this game being rough in any way at all. Bob Scott has this to say about it. I think there's too much emphasis placed on the, uh, or talk on the, uh, the body contact angle of, of rugby. Uh, I feel that uh, it is more the evading of the body contact is the, is the real and true skill of the game. By the time a player has reached first-class club rugby, He's more than keen, and usually has his sights set on improving his game and playing for his province in a Ranfurly Shield challenge. The Ranfurly Shield, affectionately known as the Loggerwood, is the country's premier trophy in interprovincial rugby and is competed for on a challenge basis. Every weekend during the latter part of the football season, a challenging team with supporters invades the holders of the Shield's territory in an attempt to take it home. 
Rugby fans will travel hundreds of miles to see a challenge and are not backward in showing who they support. The heroes of the day, the players, watch the carry-on from their hotel balcony. procession, which is a show of strength by the supporters, most of them make for the nearest hotel to await the start of the game and the hijinks carry on. The tradition of the Ranfurly Shield goes back to 1901, when His Excellency, the Earl of Ranfurly, the then Governor of New Zealand, presented the trophy for interprovincial competition. Many fans consider a shield game an ideal opportunity for a good time. Others treat the game with its true reverence. And as the stands fill up, the teams are given their last minute instructions. The team talk is a serious business. The coach trying to talk his troops into giving everything in the ensuing battle. It's not necessary for me to tell you blokes just how important this game is. Now we've got the advantage of having the wind in the first spell and we'll use it. We'll use everything in our power to dominate this game and get the points that we need. Now the ball coming in from the wing three quarters have got to go to our line out forwards and go just exactly as we want it. And when we get it Nev, we want you to use that ball, get it back to ice at half back and then ice, you judge the play. The good stuff you'll put out through our backs and we'll use it to the best advantage that we possibly can. Anything that's scruffy, slam it away to touch and we'll start the thing over again. Now these blokes have got a tremendous pattern and their pattern of play we've got to upset. So any ball that they win in the line out, any of their line out ball has got to be put on the deck. Put the player on the deck, put the ball on the deck and you've got to get through. Now Junior, if you can't get through, if you can't get your body through, put your dirty big number nine through, right under his nose. Any of that ball that their halfback gets, I want the ball and two men with it. Now don't let them get away with this. Pressure then from our uh, back of our line out onto their five eights, so that any of that scruffy ball gets lost out there, gets put on the deck, and then Graham, you've got to be in on it in the flash. Up with it, Freddie, and that ball that they've won, we want to get that ball and we want to use it. Righto? Representative matches, whether they be provincial or international, are big business, and enormous sums of money are collected at the gates. During the 1965 Springbok Tour, the 13 provincial unions, as well as the New Zealand Rugby Union, which controls the sport at the national level, shared over a third of a million pounds in gate takings. We asked Mr. Tom Morrison, chairman of the New Zealand Rugby Union, what happens to this money. Rugby is an amateur game, the players are amateur, and the administrators who administrate the game are amateurs, all in it for the love of the game. The figure mentioned uh, of the returns of the South African tour in 1965, of course, are subject to the cost of the tour, which must be taken off that. Now, money that is surplus and uh, is available for the New Zealand Rugby Union to distribute for the good of the game is spent in improved facilities for the players, uh, ground accommodation, covered seating accommodation and the likes. And any further monies that are surplus are used to further the game. In other words, all monies that are taken at rugby are accounted for in the sense that it is ploughed back into the game itself. Rugby has a big following because most males in this crowd would have played the game at some time or another and know all the finer points of the sport. As spectators they come and pay big money to see good open rugby and are usually not disappointed at a shield match.
but shield fever is only a mild complaint compared to the performance when an international team touring the country is about to play a test match. Normally sedate New Zealanders about this time go slightly crazy and do the most extraordinary things to guarantee they will see the big match. Some of them will sleep outside the ground so that they can get their pet place on the terrace when the gates open. Because of the large numbers of people from out of town descending for the weekend, most hotels are booked out months before. Theatres run continuous movies so the bedless can have a roof over their heads. These small discomforts don't worry the enthusiasts, who can always fill in time by talking about their theories and who should be in the team, etc. A test match attracts crowds of around 50,000. And since 1905, when the first official New Zealand team was formed, the All Blacks have had a very good record in international matches. In recent years, many fine teams have toured New Zealand, the famous ones being the British Lions, the Frenchmen, the South African Springboks and the Australian Wallabies. During these tours, New Zealand rugby fans have seen the sport at its best. Let's see how the world's top players have thrilled the crowds in some test matches played in New Zealand in recent years. This is how the radio commentators saw the play at the time. Isles have got it, but it's well buried underneath. There it comes out to Brisco. He can't get the ball away. They're on top of him. Five yards inside the British Isles half. And it's picked up by Winneray, playing it half back to Levine. And he's broken through to the 10-yard mark. He's still going. He's up to the 25. He's kicked one back into the centre. And Young is there, and Young swoops it up. The second spell back to Connor, and here comes Don Clark with a punt. Wait for it. Wait for it. It is over.
Fullbacks attacking down by five points to three. 21 minutes gone. Laidlaw to put the ball into the scrum and it's hooked cleanly and here comes Dickin as the extra man. However, he's caught and taken to the ground by Nil and over the top of it goes Ellis but it's picked up now by Morton. He kicks one downfield and ten yards out from his goal line. Wilson can't take it on first bounce and then dives on the ball. There's a big for it. It's a try. Come long for the Huntsman's loud call. But where can be found such a musical sound as the old rugby cry on the ball? On the ball, on the ball. Let sluggers at home then remain. We'll kick and we'll follow, we'll run past and call up as we shout the same merry refrain. On the ball, on the ball, on the ball, through scrum it's three quarters at all. Sticking together we keep on the leather and shout as we go on the ball. This life's not the scrummage, we cannot get through, but with many a kick and a blow. And then in the end, though we dodge and we fend, still let your collar death days as well. On the ball, on the ball, on the ball, through scrummage three quarters.